Thanks for listening to the Grace First podcast. If you want to know more about us, head on over to gracefirst.church. Or if you're in the Wichita area, come visit us Sundays at 1015. Well, this morning, uh, before I begin the scripture reading, I just want to say a couple of words. Uh, We will have an all-church prayer meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. And I want you to know that the teenagers and uh, the children are also invited. And so parents, uh, you can make that decision uh, whether or not you think that your children can sit in. Uh, We will have a time of of some couple of uh, hymns as well as uh, just some... A uh, testament of people just sharing uh, what God is doing uh, for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll go into our prayer session for about 30 minutes. Uh, I, I recognize that, yes, the Chiefs are playing tonight, uh, but as believers, our priority is in coming together and worshiping and praying together as a church. And so I do want to invite you uh, tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, the other thing, uh, we are in Mark 13 as we are in uh, the Christ return uh, passages that Jesus taught. And I just want to make a few book recommendations. Uh, some of these, are, or may, all of these, are books that I've used this week to prepare our study. Uh, there are these books called Four Views. Uh, there is a Four Views on the Creation as well. That's very good. Uh, and they give four uh, different views of uh, the interp- different ways to interpret the book of Revelation. Uh, this is, um, it's by counterpoints, and I want to recommend this as well as the three views on the rapture. And it's a very scholarly discussion uh, and how a debate ought to be conducted, not what you would necessarily see on TV during presidential uh, nomination years. Uh, so these are very good books that I would highly recommend. Uh, another one is uh, a systematic theology book. Sometimes you see books that are so thick like this and you think, man, I don't even want to touch that. But there are wonderful sections in there that you can uh, go into your own study regarding the, the end times, uh, the creation even. Uh, it has a, it's a systematic understanding of uh, understanding the gospel and the Bible. And so there are wonderful uh, ways that are, that are expounded by this uh, scholar named John Frame. He's a wonderful theologian, a very uh, conservative theologian, so I would recommend that. If that book is too heavy or it's a little intimidating, this is a wonderful one as well. Uh, this was done, uh, produced by the tireless effort of Greg Strand, who is our theology director uh, for the Free Church, uh, as well as uh, my, my dear mentor, uh, Pastor Bill Kynes. Uh, and it is, a one, it's a systematic, it is basically something like this, uh, broken down into a smaller book, but it uh, expounds the various theological views from the, the creation all the way to the return of Christ. This is a second edition, Evangelical Convictions, uh, and this has come out after 2019 when the Free Church adopted the new statement on Article 9 of our Statement of Faith regarding the return of Christ. So I would highly recommend that to you. Well, the scripture reading this morning is going to be uh, from 1 Thessalonians. If you'd like to follow along, uh, there are pew Bibles in front of you. Uh, You can open your app. It's going to be from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this passage is on Paul's teaching on the events of the return of Christ. And this is the first letter that he sent to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, And I'm going to be reading from chapter 4, starting in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 
I now want you to turn over to the next letter, which is the 2 Thessalonians. And we are going to be reading this next section in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now in this passage, the Thessalonian church had thought that they had missed the coming of Christ. Okay? And so in this letter, Paul is addressing that issue by telling them that, hey, calm down, you haven't missed it. And when he does, he says that they will see certain events that will come to pass. Like what he's about to describe here in this passage about this man of lawlessness that we understand to be the Antichrist. So starting in verse 1 in chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in, in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. This is the word of the Lord. Let's be to God. Well, I want to invite Glenn up for a pastoral prayer this morning. There we go. Let's bow our heads in prayer and honor before the Lord. Father, we've come here collectively to worship you. We worship you as our God. We worship the Son, Jesus, our Savior, and we worship the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for giving us all these three. Father, uh, this morning we worship you as not only the creator, but Father, the giver of eternal life, not just life here, but life everlasting. Father, uh, you made us in your image. You made us for a purpose. You want a relationship with us. Father, we've sang songs and hymns this morning in our worship, telling of all the great attributes you have, of your love, of your grace, and of your priceless mercy. Father, it's beyond what we could even hope to either pay or earn in order to have that. So, Father, let's, as a church, take a few moments to just worship you as our Father this morning. Thank you, Father. And Father, you saw in our creation that we sinned, that we fell from your grace. And so you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross and pay the price for all of our sins. He not only died for us, but Father, he died because of us. And Jesus, we give you praise this morning for being that light in our lives giving us that hope and that assurance that we will forever be with you, that you have fully paid the price. Father, uh, I just pray that we'll right now take a few moments to thank Jesus and to reflect on him and his finished work on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for that act of dying in our place, giving us eternal life. We worship you this morning. But Father, uh, Jesus is at your right hand, but you have given us another gift, and that is the Holy Spirit. Father, this morning we worship 
you, Holy Spirit. You are here with us. You're inside of us. You're collectively with this body of believers. You give us the power. You give us the focus. But, Father, you also do more than that. You're our good shepherd. Holy Spirit, you guide us through this valley that we walk through called life. And Holy Spirit, you are the one in our lives that reminds us of how to act and treat others, how to respond. Holy Spirit, you have inspired your word within our hearts so that we know how to live and glorify you and truly worship you. Father, let's just take a few moments again to just give you thanks for all that you are in our lives, who you are, what you are, and how we would be nothing without you. And Father, I thank you this morning for the good shepherd, and I also thank you for the shepherd that you've given this flock. You've given us Tim. Pastor Tim is our leader. He works hard to love the sheep, to lead the sheep, to teach the sheep. Father, I lift him up as he brings your word and your truth to us this morning. Father, may we hear, may we listen, may we then apply what we learned this morning as we worship together and give you the praise that you truly deserve. We ask this in the name of the our Father, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, there is a phrase in every language and in every culture that describes a feeling of disappointment when somebody doesn't believe what you say. And that phrase in the English language is, I told you so. That phrase is commonly used by parents, grandparents, and also those giving dating advice. When I was living in Hawaii, uh, I led a young adults group at my church, and somehow I found myself giving a lot of dating advice to young single ladies. Most of my advice sounded like this. Don't date him. He is not a believer, and he's only going to cause unnecessary pain and heartache. You are not going to change him. But almost always, I could sense that they were thinking, but I can change him. My hope was that they would believe what I said and act on it. And most times, they would come back months later and they would be in tears and say, he's such a jerk, I'm never talking to him ever again. Now I was a good brother, a good big brother to most of them, and I heard them cry as they vented. And I wouldn't say it, but in my mind I would think, I told you so. Now I'm sure you've said that phrase in your life. You know, I've even heard my children say it to each other and also to me. But this is a phrase that we don't really want to say. Instead, we'd rather see them, the person, just believe us and act on it. Because by the time you say, I told you so, the damage has already been done and it is too late. Likewise, as Christians, as we tell the world about Jesus, some people will believe you and will turn to Jesus in faith. But many people will not. Much like what Noah and his family experienced in his days, most people will not believe your proclamation about Christ that he is the king and the judge. And when he returns, it will be too late for us to even say, I told you so. Last week, we saw the first 13 verses in Mark chapter 13 where Jesus told the disciples the general signs of his uh, return including wars, natural disasters, false prophets and messiahs, and the persecution of the church. As we saw from some of the very key events leading up to the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem in 70 AD, 
these are events which have been taking place in the past, that are currently taking place, and will take place in the future. But this morning, Jesus will state some obvious worldwide events which will precede his return. And these will be clear indications that his return is imminent. On January 13th in 2018, as tensions between North Korea and U.S. were rising, Hawaiian residents received the following text message around 8 a.m. local time. The U.S. Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. If you are indoors, stay indoors. If you're outdoors, seek immediate shelter in a building. Remain indoors well away from windows. This is not a drill. Take immediate action. How would you like to wake up to that text? Likewise. Now, it turned out okay, that this was a false alarm, but everyone in Hawaii who received this message, they, uh, including some of our family and friends, they sought shelter immediately, and because an attack was imminent. Well, likewise, Jesus revealed some key worldwide events which will require us to take immediate action because when the following events take place, his return is imminent. So this is Jesus' emergency broadcast message to his church that when these events happen, take immediate action because this is not a drill. So what are these events? Since I left you on a cliffhanger last week, we'll, let, we'll get straight into it. Turn with me to Mark chapter 13. Now as we read this passage... I want you to keep in mind what I said last week about uh, prophetic texts and about the hilltops that ultimately lead to the mountain peak event. The same terms used in the Old Testament to describe past events are also used by Jesus to describe future events, which are both near and far. So with that in mind, join me in Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 14. We're going to read through Uh, Verse 23, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, I want you to underline that phrase, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back or get their cloak. How dreadful it'll be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress. I want you to underline that again or that too. Unequal from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen... He has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. The first event Jesus revealed is, the abomination that causes desolation. This is also your first point in your outline if you're following the sermon outline. So what is this event? The abomination of desolation is an event prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel 9, 27, we read this prophecy. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The term abomination used in Daniel means something that is hated by God, which is caused by idolatry, that is usually pagan. And desolation means that something has been destroyed or devastated. And in the context of Daniel's book, 
This prophecy was a clear prediction of the desecration of the temple by the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes in 167 BC. But Jesus' use of this phrase is much more difficult and complex. There are several options that have been debated throughout church history. Some have related this event with the Pontius Pilate's orders to have his soldiers go into Jerusalem on standards of idols. And that uh, event was called Affair of Standards, and it took place in 26 AD. Some have claimed that this was Emperor Caligula's order to stand up a statue of himself in the Jerusalem temple around 40 AD. But neither of these events caused the Jews to flee. Nor was it deadly. It just caused uh, some disruption, but it wasn't a deadly event. A stronger possibility for the abomination of desolation are the events leading up to the, uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD under the Roman general Titus. Titus uh, and his soldiers of the 10th Roman legion, they set up a defensive perimeter and they sieged Jerusalem. And at the climax of this, they entered the temple and set up standards of idols in the temple and worshipped Titus as their emperor as they offered sacrifices. These events around 70 AD seem to be a stronger option to describe the abomination of desolation, but uh, it is not definitive by any means. Historical records from Josephus indicate that the Jews actually fled into Jerusalem and not out of it, as Jesus warned in uh, verses 14 through 19. And to add to the evidence, once Titus was in the temple, no one could escape Jerusalem. And anyone who tried to escape Jerusalem were either killed by the Romans or the Zealots. But not only that, Jesus said in verse 18 that this flight will likely take place in the winter. But Titus' siege of Jerusalem took place in summer, July through September of 70 AD. So which event was Jesus talking about? All these events that I described that took place in history, from Antiochus in 167 BC to the Pontius Pilate to Caligula's statue to Titus' destruction of the temple... All seem to be possible that these could be the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. But as we analyze the historical evidence, Jesus seems to be pointing to a major event in the future. Why do we think that this is pointing to another future event? Well, look what, look what he said in verse 19. It says, Those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Without a doubt, the fall of Jerusalem was a traumatic event. When Jerusalem fell to Rome, an estimated 1.1 million Jews were killed and about 97,000 of them were uh, taken captive. Outside the city, the Romans crucified so many Jews that they actually ran out of crosses to crucify them. Now, these numbers are likely somewhat exaggerated by Josephus, but they clearly highlight the horrible tragedy that the Jews experienced in 70 AD. Inside, there was extreme infighting. There was murder. There was famine, disease, and even reports of cannibalism. But historically... Is this the worst tribulation the Jews have experienced? Less than a hundred years ago from today, the Jews suffered greatly under the hands of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. An estimated number of six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. When we compare the 1.1 million Jews to the uh, from 70 AD to the six million Jews during World War II, the fall of 70 AD cannot seem to be the great tribulation that is unequaled from the beginning and never to be equaled again. So then Jesus' warning on the abomination of desolation must be a future event that is to come. 
an event led by a man described in Paul's writings as the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians 2.4, we read that he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets up He sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This event of the Antichrist will be accompanied by a a worldwide distress known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation or the Great Days of Distress. This is your second point in your outline. Notice that in Mark 13, Jesus didn't give us A lot of the other events given to us in the other prophetic and apocalyptic texts in the Bible, such as the events revealed in the book of Revelation. Here, Jesus only gave us three events. The abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, followed by his return. But God has revealed several other events throughout the Bible, which we must consider when making sense of the logical timeline of his return. This great tribulation is a seven-year period where the Antichrist is given worldwide authority to reign and persecute the church. And this tribulation is marked by great difficulties for believers, as Jesus noted in verse 17, as he described the hardships that, uh, that pregnant women and nursing mothers may face. In Revelation 13, 16 through 18, we read of the description of the beast's mandate, the Antichrist's mandate. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. The Antichrist in the tribulation, and what, what he will do during that time is the beginning of the end times events, which will unfold in the future. There are several more events which will unfold, yet these are the main events which Jesus chose to highlight for the church to look for when when his return is near. During the Christmas time, did you guys build any puzzles? Anyone build puzzles? Well, our family loves to build puzzles, And one of the most frustrating experiences about building a puzzle is when you have a big chunk of the pieces missing. You have several pieces missing, in which case you can't see the whole picture. Well, much like an incomplete puzzle, there are events of the end times referenced throughout the Old Testament in the Bible, and they all provide the puzzle pieces to the picture of Jesus' return, but they're not complete. Because Jesus revealed, uh, Jesus revealed to the apostles directly by teaching them and by giving them visions to give us more pieces to the puzzle regarding his return. In addition to the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation, there are many more events, the puzzle pieces in the book of Revelation and other prophetic writings. There are great wars like the Armageddon, the Mog and the Magog, or the Gog and the Magog, the return of Christ, the rapture of the church, the millennial kingdom, the resurrection of the believers and non-believers, the great white throne judgment, and the new heaven and the new earth. But ultimately, the most emphasized event that Jesus mentions is the return of Christ. So join me in verses 24 to 27 as we read of these events, or read of this event. But in those days... Following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Here's your third point in your outline. And this is the most important aspect of the end, which is the glorious return of Christ. 
Here, Jesus used the words directly out of Isaiah 13.10 to describe the day of his return, which is also known as the day of the Lord. And depending on the historical context, the day of the Lord can refer to a few different events. For the Jews in the Babylonian captivity, the day of the Lord uh, was the judgment, the day of judgment under Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this day of cosmic chaos also took place, if you remember, on the day of Christ's crucifixion, which was a judgment for sin for believers. And this celestial quake will happen again in the final final judgment for all sin when Christ returns in the future on the day of the Lord. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus makes it clear That his return is not a spiritual or an allegorical return, but it's going to be a bodily return. He will come visibly in the clouds with great power and glory in the same way that he ascended into heaven visibly into the clouds. Church, Christ's return is a final and ultimate hope for believers. His return is will be personal, visible, historical, and it will be glorious. It will vindicate our message as it will display before the world that our triune God is the one true God of the universe. Christ's return, it will be the fulfillment of his purpose, plan, and promises to his children. And when we reign with him in the new heaven and the new earth, the problem of evil will be resolved forever. There is a good God. And though evil exists in our lifetime, a time will come when this good and all-powerful God will judge all evil and punish evil throughout history forever. If you're a believer this morning, and you are in Christ, who, is, uh, who recognizes Jesus as the king and the judge, he is coming for you to take you with him, and you have nothing to fear. He says to you, be ready, and you tell the world that I'm coming soon. But if you've never trusted as your Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then he is drawing to you by the truth of this proclaimed word, and he calls you to turn from your life of sin, to turn to him, and to live a life of holiness before it's too late. No matter how dark your past sins may be, his blood is sufficient for you. And his blood is sufficient to cover your sin and forgive you that you may be with him forever. So do not delay because his return will either be a day of great joy or will be a day of great fear. As we have seen so far, interpreting prophetic texts is a difficult task Because we have to work hard to distinguish the fulfilled hilltop events of the past from the mountain peak uh, event of the future. And prophetic texts need to be interpreted carefully since there are both symbolic and literal aspects of this book. It's not easy to interpret numbers and time references given to us in the book of Revelation. It's also difficult to interpret the various events and the pictures in the visions of the dragon, the horns, the head. And we have to choose whether or not we interpret them more literally or figuratively or a combination of both. This is why we have several different views on how we understand the end times events and how they will unfold. But we can't just throw our hands in the air and quit. As disciples of Christ, we must go as far as our minds can take us to understand this critical aspect of theology, eschatology, because God has moved time and history to provide us with the revealed Word of God, which is the very Bible that we have in front of us. Now, as I attempt to explain some of these views in more detail, you're going to have way more questions that I'm going to have time to address this morning. So I would recommend a personal study or a study with a couple of friends or even in your small groups and uh, study through some of the books that I've recommended for you. 
you will find that people in your small groups are, some of them are going to be very knowledgeable about uh, this particular aspect. Ultimately, there are two basic ways to interpret these writings. One is to interpret them more figuratively, and another is to, uh, to be more direct or interpret them in a literal sense. I want to share some of the different views which have been uh, held by scholars and theologians and pastors throughout church history. You may have picked up a handout on your way in, and this is a handout that I found online, and this was the most helpful visual that I could find. And I'm going to be focusing on the four views on the bottom. The first three views shown on there, uh, idealism, historicism, and preterism, are not views that most Bible-believing Christians today would consider to be strong biblical views. Since they interpret the end times events more allegorically and some almost purely symbolically, with preterism interpreting Christ's return as a symbolic return of Christ in 70 AD. But we know that Christ has not yet returned, and his return will be bodily and visible. So let's walk through some of these views, uh, these different views, and I'm going to go over them in order they were developed in church history, which is also a very important part. Uh, in there, you're going to see on the first one, historical view, uh, it says Wycliffe to Spurgeon. Uh, that's not necessarily saying that they held to that view of uh, historicism, but that's a time reference. Okay, that's not, Spurgeon didn't hold to historicism. So let's get the first slide up. Okay, this first view is called historic premillennialism or classic premillennialism. Revelation chapter 20 states that there will be a thousand-year period where Satan will be bound and Jesus will reign with his people. This thousand-year period is what we call the millennial kingdom. So premillennialism states that Jesus will return before the millennial kingdom begins. Okay, that's why it's pre. This is the oldest and the most traditional view in church history, and one that I believe is a result from the most natural reading of the prophetic texts and how the original audience understood the end times events. This was a view uh, taught by the apostles and many of the early church fathers in the first few centuries, including Papias, Justin Martyr, and Irenaeus, they held to this view. Some of the more modern proponents of this view uh, include Charles Spurgeon, uh, Douglas Moo, and Tim Cho. You may have heard of him. He's not very well known, but loves you the most out of all the people that I just listed. This view uh, has also been increasingly common in the free church in the recent years. Now, a key distinguishing mark of this view is that the rapture of the church takes place simultaneously in one major event with Christ's return after the seven-year uh, period of the Great Tribulation. Okay, the church has two different arrows here, actually. Um, if you see, the church actually has uh, this right here. It should really be one arrow, uh, but I think what he's indicating is that this is going to be a very tight event. It's basically a, a simultaneous event. Okay? In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, uh, we read that believers will meet the Lord in the air, and this is a language of a royal greeting by those welcoming a king. And in this view, uh, we understand that this passage to mean what it means, uh, what it states plainly, that Christ's return is simultaneous with the church being caught up or raptured in the air to meet him, to reign with him forever. Some have called this view a post-tribulation rapture of premillennialism. And the wrath of God and the bold judgments and the battle of Armageddon that is listed in Revelation 16 will take place near the end of the seven-year tribulation period. There's a scholar uh, named Robert Gundry. And in his book from 1973, The Church and the Tribulation, he modified this traditional post-tribulation rapture view slightly by stating that God's wrath and bold judgments will be poured out after the rapture in a very brief period of time, which is, I think, what this uh, timeline is indicating, so that the church will not be subject to God's judgment 
So in terms of the timeline of Christ's return, this modified post-tribulation view that Gundry is, is talking about, it's very similar to another premillennial view called pre-wrath rapture, where a distinction is made during the seven-year tribulation period between the wrath of man and the wrath of God. But the pre-wrath rapture view still has the, two, the return of Christ in two stages with the rapture of the church taking place before the coming of Christ. So the pre-wrath view is seen as a, a variation of the dispensational premillennialism, which I'll explain at the end. I know this can be a, a very mouthful, it could be a lot, but just hang with me. Uh, some of you love this stuff and are right on point. Some of you may fall asleep, in which case I encourage you to listen to it later. <laughs> now within the historic premillennial view, when it comes to the promises of Israel, they have been fulfilled in Christ according to view, in this view, or in the church. So that any ethnic Jew today can still be saved by faith in Christ and become a Christian, which means they're part of the church to receive the promises of God. There is no two-tiered classes of people, of Jews and the church in this view. Rather, that anyone who is in Christ, including ethnic Jews, are considered to be part of the church. This is an important distinction. So then, is there any significance in what God is doing through the nation of Israel today? We will come back to this at the end. Okay? So hold on with me. So this is the historic premillennial view of Christ's return. In summary, the, the church is not removed from the great tribulation, but goes through it, and at the end of it, Jesus returns and the church is raptured in one great event simultaneously to usher in the millennial kingdom and then to the new heaven and the new earth. Okay. Next slide. Now, in the fourth century, there was a giant theologian by the name of Augustine. The Roman Catholics call him uh, Saint Augustine, and he developed a more symbolic interpretation of the end times. This view is called amillennialism. A ah is the Latin prefix uh, that's a negation of without. So like atheist is, is without God, right? And this view of amillennialism, it takes a thousand year period of Christ's reign in a symbolic uh, interpretation, and it has already begun. This is the most common view in church history, since this view was held by the Roman Catholic Church into the Reformation, and even the Reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin held to this view. So if you talk to any uh, brothers and sisters from Presbyterian churches or Reformed churches, they will most likely hold to this view. This view sees Satan uh, as being bound according to Jesus' words in Luke 10, 18, as he saw Satan fall from heaven. And the church has been given the keys of the kingdom on behalf of Jesus who has been given all authority in heaven and earth to rule in the present age by the power of the Spirit to fulfill the Great Commission. One of the, the strengths of this view is that it captures the main focus of the New Testament's emphasis that is the return of Christ. In this view, the events of Christ's return, the resurrection of the dead, and the final judgment all occur simultaneously. Now, one event that's not included in the timeline is that there is a short period just before Christ's return where Satan is released for a short time and an apostasy breaks out right around here somewhere, okay? Okay. So in amillennialism, a more figurative interpretation is taken, and, sees, and this view sees the church ruling with Christ currently in the present age by his spirit in the millennial kingdom, which is now. Then a literal Christ return will be the final event to usher in the resurrection of the dead, the great white throne judgment, and the new heaven and the new earth. Next slide. Okay, this next view is called post-millennialism. Okay, this view originated in the 17th century by a Unitarian minister named Daniel Whitby. By the way, Unitarianism is a heresy. Okay, we believe in a Trinitarianism, right? Trini uh, we believe in the Trinity. A Unitarian just believes one God. Okay? 
And he believed, uh, Daniel Whitby believed that gospel like leaven would permeate the entire world to transform the world. The interpretation of the timeline and the events are actually very similar to amillennialism. But the main difference between this and amillennialism is that in postmillennialism, the emphasis is placed on the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And what Jesus said in Mark 13, 10, the gospel must be preached to all nations. Okay, that is emphasized here. It is an optimistic view of the gospel where preaching of the gospel around the world will lead to mass conversions, including, uh, uh, including improved moral conditions around the world, like you would see in Great Awakening. Right? The power of the gospel will change lives and societies And Isaiah's prophecy will be fulfilled, which declares that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 9. One major proponent of this view in in church history was Jonathan Edwards, who was a key player in the Great Awakening uh, here here in America in the 1700s. But with the rise of civil war, uh, and, and end World War I. And by the time of the, the World War II, this view had lost popularity. As people realized that moral conditions around the world were not getting any better. But this view has seen actually a resurgence in recent years. Uh, you may have heard uh, a man by the name of Douglas Wilson, uh, who is out in Idaho. Uh, he holds to this view. So, in post-millennialism, The emphasis is on the fulfillment of the Great Commission and the gospel proclamation transforming both the individuals and the society in a positive and an optimistic manner. Next slide. This is the final view. And this is the most recent view in church history. It's called dispensationalism or dispensational premillennialism. Much like the historic premillennialism, There will be a seven-year tribulation in the future, and then Christ will return to usher in the millennial kingdom. But the church will be raptured before the seven-year tribulation in a secret rapture where believers will disappear from the world. You may have heard of uh, book series or movies uh, called Left Behind, right? Where people, like somebody's flying an airplane and the pilot disappears and they have to figure out what to do. Um, Well, that, that book or that series uh, reflects this theology. And this rapture of the church prior to Christ's return, uh, whether in pre-trib, mid-trib, or pre-wrath, helps make sense of what Jesus said in Mark 13, 20, where he said that God will shorten the days for the elect. Right? But in order to really understand why dispensationalism holds to uh, this pre-tribulation rapture, we have to unpack this a little bit. Classic dispensationalism, okay, that's what it's called, uh, was a system of theology developed around the mid-19th century uh, by a theologian named John Nelson Darby. And this was the main system of theology that was actually taught in a Dallas Theological Seminary, DTS, in the 1900s. And if you are coming from a Baptistic background, uh, you are likely familiar with this or uh, were part of this influence. In this system, there are seven ages or dispensations throughout history of how God has ordered his relationship with mankind. In other words, God has worked to save people in different ways in different eras in history. The creation has led to the age of innocence, which is the first dispensation, The fall led to the age of conscience. The flood led to the age of human government. Abrahamic covenant led to the age of promise. Mosaic covenant led to the age of the law. And Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has led to the age of grace or the age of the church, which we are in today. And this current age or this dispensation will end with the church being gone or raptured before the great seven-year tribulation. In other words, that's the marker that begins the next dispensation. So that 
The final age of this system, known as the age of the millennial kingdom, can be ushered in with the second coming of Christ. Now, most dispensation theologians will affirm that salvation is through grace by faith. Okay, they will affirm that. And so it would be a straw man to uh, deny that. But there is a two very distinct uh, system of how God views the Christians and the Jews. Okay? The church and the Jews are very strict, uh, strictly separated here. What's important to know about it is that a strict distinction between the nation of Israel and the church is made. The promises of God to the nation of Israel are still in effect and will be fulfilled in some tangible way into the millennial kingdom. And under this view, God has a future purpose for geopolitical nations like America, for Korea, for Mexico. And Israel will have a functional role of leadership in the world in the millennial kingdom. So it makes a clear divide between the church as the heavenly people and the Jews as the earthly people into the millennial kingdom. And even the sacrifices of the Old Testament are to be revived in the temple in Jerusalem, which will be rebuilt and be used in the millennium according to this view. So you can see that proponents of this view would support the nation of Israel today because the Jews and the land of Jerusalem would still be considered under the promises of God. Now this was a very popular view even in the free church in the 1950s, but it's less so today due to some of the, the more major theological issues related to this view. The New Testament emphasizes that we, the church, are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus was the final sacrifice who secured our atonement so that we no longer have to make sacrifices for salvation. But classic dispensational view has two classes of people in the way God would save his people, or at least relate with them. Okay? The Bible tells us that there is no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and gives richly to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Many classic dispensationalists have since departed from the system and have adopted a, a more unified approach to the biblical understanding of the covenants between the, ch uh, the church and the Jews. And this, this is called progressive dispensationalism. Uh, under progressive dispensationalism, though I'm not an expert in that particular view, uh, they see one covenant for both. So there's a little bit more of a unified approach as opposed to two separate covenants for the Jews and for believers, for the church. In progressive dispensationalism, the rapture of the church still takes place before the Great Tribulation sometime, but the reason is not grounded in, in the theological system itself, but a bit more on the scripture, actually. One argument that is rooted in the timing of the rapture uh, that they use from 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is this. Uh, Dr. Craig Blazing, uh, he argues, that, uh, who's a proponent of this view, uh, he argues that the text says nothing about their accompanying him, that is Christ, on the completion of Jesus' descent. Rather, Paul concludes his description of the event with the assembly in heaven. In other words, he views the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 not as a simultaneous event with the coming of Christ, but as a drawn-out event, uh, whether that be seven years or three and a half years uh, or possibly shorter. The variation of the dispensational views that hold to a different time of the rapture, which is not simultaneous with Christ's return, like pre-trib or mid-trib or pre-rapture view, would also interpret this passage in the same way as a two-stage return of Christ. But if this argument is grounded in 1 Thessalonians 4, positing time into this verse of seven years or, or less, to force a rapture to Christ's return into this verse seemed to be an argument from silence. Now, I think you can still make the argument uh, abductively by bringing in uh, other prophetic texts, which these views do actually very well with pretty convincing interpretations. 
But to see this particular verse as a drawn-out process of up to seven years is to, in my view, is to stretch the text more than what it has revealed. So, dispensationalism is a complex theological system that is marked by, uh, characterized by pre-tribulation rapture of the church with strict distinctions made to the Jews and to the church. You can bring the slide down now. So, what is my view? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my conviction is, is the position that the apostles taught. And to interpret the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 in the plainest sense, that the return of Christ and the rapture is speaking of one great event there. I believe that if the great tribulation were to take place in our lifetime, that the church will go through it, but God will not forsake us. Jesus made it clear to his disciples that there will be hardships and trials when we follow Jesus. He even said that we must carry our cross and follow him. Now, having said that, I kind of hope that the dispensationalists are right and that we will be removed from the great tribulation, but I don't think that's the case. Now, you may certainly disagree with me on your stance on the end times, but I want to urge you to not just any mini mani mo it, but do your own study and talk to the people in your small group. Talk to your elders and pastors and formulate your own thought by reading your Bible. And read the whole Bible cover to cover and the Lord will give you a conviction as he speaks to you through the scripture. But we also have to approach our study in the end times with great humility. We have to recognize that interpreting prophetic and apocalyptic texts is difficult. And most of these views will be wrong. They can't all be right, right? So study the scripture and grow closer to the Lord through your time with him. But don't divide fellowship over your disagreements on this. This is what we would call a third order doctrine, where it is not about the Trinity, it is not about salvation, uh, and, and there are difficult interpretations associated with this, so we can disagree on this and still fellowship and still have potlucks together. No need to split the church over this issue. So then what about Israel? Is there any significance in what God is doing in the nation of Israel today? This is a hard question. It's a harder question to answer, but I believe that there is. And it's not a, uh, one that is associated with the national Israel. The nation of Israel today is one of the most secular nations and arguably one of the nations that is very hostile to the gospel. But as a sovereign nation, one that has been recognized as a democracy, if enemies of Israel are attacking them on all sides and committing horrendous attacks to their women and children, well, Israel has all the right to defend themselves and they must be supported so my support for Israel in the, the current skirmish against their, the terrorist group Hamas is grounded not necessarily in the dispensational theological system, as many Christians today claim, but in the Christian ethics of living out our Lord's mandate to love our neighbor. I don't think there will be a two-tiered classes of people in the millennium and into the new heaven and the new earth. But I do believe that God has a plan and that he's using the gathering of the Jews back in the nation of Israel today and will somehow save them in mass through Christ in the future. Well, why do I believe that? Well, in Romans 11.24, we read that, after all, if you, that is Gentiles, <coughs> were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the Jews, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? In Revelation 7, we also read that there will be 144,000 Jews from different tribes. And some scholars read this to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. But I think it's also possible that the regathering of the Jews to the current nation of Israel that began in 1948 
could be the start of something that will be fulfilled uh, that we read about in the 144,000, whether that be in our lifetime or centuries from now. And I recognize that it's difficult to interpret these numbers, to see them either figuratively or literally, since there are numbers associated with 12 and 1,000. So I want to uh, be, be humble about it and recognize that I don't have all the answers regarding that. But I want to close with some applications. What can we take away from learning about all these different views about Christ's return? Well, first, as I mentioned earlier, the return of Christ is the vindication of our faith. Through his return, our Lord will confirm once for all that he is the one true God who has come to fulfill his promises. He will accomplish his plan because he is the almighty God and there is none like him. Second, Christ will return as the king and the judge. He came as a sacrificial lamb, as a baby in, that, in Bethlehem in that manger to first deal with the problem of sin by living a sinless life to earn the merit of righteousness, by dying a sacrificial death to pave the penalty for sinners and rising again to justify sinners, he has made a way for sinners like us to come to him in faith and be saved from sin. But when he returns, he will return as a roaring lion. He will come in vengeance to slay the evil dragon and all evil do doers to deal with the problem of evil and to rescue his bride from this broken and fallen world. This is the hope that we profess, that he will come again to rescue us and we will meet him again to reign, in, to reign with him forever. Finally, this means that we must proclaim Christ to the world before it's too late. See, time is limited. Until he comes again, we must labor diligently to tell the world that he lives and that Jesus is the Messiah who came to save sinners and that this Christ is coming soon again. We do not know the day of his return, but what we do know is that we are one day closer to the day of his return. This means that we do not just sit back and, and flip our noses to the world as his elect. We would rather not say, I told you so. But instead, we must participate in God's work and fulfill his commission to proclaim Christ to the ends of the earth. Because we as the elect, we do not know who God, whom God has chosen to save. And so we must go in faith and as his agents to evangelize and proclaim him with all wisdom by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our responsibility, and that is our privilege. So let us go and tell the world that our king is returning soon before it's too late. Amen? Well, let's pray.